So we're going to be talking about bias, and uh, we're going to talk about the importance of understanding uh, sources of bias and how to account for them and correct for them, and more importantly, prevent bias for when you're doing your final project. So a bias is just a systematic, uh, a systematic problem that affects the results that you get, um, and it can enter at a few places. The first problem you can run into is sampling bias. And so when you're making your sample, you can choose your sample and inadvertently get the wrong results because of the way you've done that. And so one of those is having uh, the sampling frame not represent the population that you're interested in actually knowing something about. So the sampling frame doesn't represent the population. So that sounds hard when you say it like that, but basically it works something like this. So if you uh, were at a badminton tournament and you said, do you think the student council needs to spend more money on badminton gear or on library books? Probably the answer is going to be more often the student council should spend money on badminton gear. The problem there is you've chosen a group of people that are very enthusiastic about badminton, and they may be enthusiastic about library books, but the whole population might be more enthusiastic about library books and less enthusiastic about badminton. So the problem there is you've chosen a group of people that don't represent the average of the population. And so you've chosen the wrong sampling frame because it doesn't represent the population. So the sampling frame could be badminton players. Sure enough, they belong to the school, uh, but in fact, you want a better representative sample for the whole school. Okay, so that's a form of what's known as sampling bias, or at least an example of it. Uh, the second, problem you can run into is that your data collection method can actually uh, bias the sample that you get. So for example, you could have a Facebook poll so this is the way you're collecting your data. You've decided you're going to use a Facebook poll and you're going to uh, have that pull on the value of social media. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a form of technology like you use a Facebook poll. Maybe you use a mobile phone survey to, to ask people if mobile phone usage, um, if they use their mobile phones a lot, okay? If you are calling people or texting them on their mobile phones, that means they've got a phone, and you're probably missing a whole portion of the population that doesn't have any po uh, phones. In this case, you're using a technology to collect your data that is actually going to prejudice the outcome of your survey, and so this will result in sampling bias. Probably people who already use Facebook will value social media more than those who don't, but you won't access that portion of the population that doesn't. Ronald Stanton, Council Park, please. Okay, so... Those are both examples of sampling bias. And there's a second example, or a second major class of sampling bias that's known as non-response bias. Okay. So in the case of non-response bias, you're doing a survey, for example, and the people who aren't responding to the survey are an important part of the population that you're not sampling. So for example, you could have a survey on how busy people are. So there's your survey. You want to find out you know, uh, how busy people are in your school. And uh, busy people don't respond. And so 
you're going to get a result that underrepresents the number of hours that people are busy for. And that's because the busy people are non-responders. So quite often you'll see that. They'll say, we distributed 100 surveys, 10 came back, and uh, that's called non-response bias. 90 people chose not to respond to that survey. They could be an important representation of what your population is. Okay, and notice non-response bias is still a form of sampling bias. Okay, let's look at another kind of bias that looks just like non-response bias minus the non. And this is called response bias. So this is where people are responding to your question or you're getting your sample, but um, you don't get the right answers for people. So for example, in the American election, uh, it looked like Hillary Clinton was going to win in many of the states. And uh, the question was, who are you going to vote for? And these are typically done by uh, telephone surveys. And so there's a human on the other end. And a lot of people were going to vote for Donald Trump, but didn't feel comfortable saying they were going to vote for Donald Trump. And they would say, well, I think I'm going to vote for Hillary Clinton. And so, um, so they'd say, oh, I'm going to vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, but really, they were going to vote for Donald Trump. They just didn't want to admit it to the person on the phone. Okay, so that's an example of response bias. Another example would be when I uh, ask people uh, if they've done their homework, and then I look at them and they nod yes. Um, that's response bias. Maybe they didn't do their homework, but it's a lot easier for them to nod yes than it is to tell the truth. And so when I look at my whole classroom, I'll likely get a, a misleading idea of what the average of the people doing the homework was. Okay, so there we go. We've got non-response bias, response bias, and then the last thing is measurement bias. And so in this case, the method I've chosen to measure things is constantly biasing my results. And so this is the example where you've got a meter stick and you didn't realize that the bottom 10 centimeters was chopped off it. And you've gone through and you've measured the heights of your soybean plants without knowing that you, know, you were already starting at 10. And so this meter stick, every time you go to measure a soybean plant, it's going to give you an extra 10 centimeters. In other words, all the measurements are biased an additional 10 centimeters towards the tall side. So that would be an extreme example of measurement bias. So in other words, uh, your measurement, uh, your collection method consistently misrepresents, misrepresents the data in one direction only. Okay, so in the case of the ruler, you're always getting a taller soybean plant. Okay, there are other uh, there are other ways. So if you're doing a survey, for example, you can ask the leading question. So a leading question is a question that already contains a possible answer. And what you're actually doing when you're asking the, the leading question is you're subtly biasing uh, your respondents to probably give the answer or the example answer that you've provided. So you might say, uh, what do you think the greatest hit, uh, do you think the greatest hit the Beatles ever had was she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah? Um, because I've already included a possible answer, probably a lot of people are going to say, yeah, I think that is the greatest hit the Beatles ever had. They probably don't think about it, okay? In a courtroom, they often say, um, you know, they'll object to leading questions. And so 
a lawyer might ask a witness, they'll say, um, did you see the broken headlight? That's called the leading question because they're actually putting in the mind of the person a possible, uh, a possible answer. Yes, I saw that uh, broken headlight. Instead, they need to say, did you notice anything about the condition of the car? So that they're not providing a possible answer to the question, to avoid that leading question. The next one is a loaded question. And so a loaded question um, already has some sort of emotional content in it. So uh, something like this, uh, Hitler uh, implemented socialized medicine. So this is how you start out your question. This is a bit of an extreme example. Um, so uh, do you think socialized medicine is good? Okay, that's a poor example of a question. You would never ask a question like that, but you get the idea. Uh, this is a loaded question. Automatically, when people see that, they're going to say, oh my goodness, Hitler and socialized medicine. Um, uh, I, I don't think Hitler's good, and so uh, socialized medicine probably isn't good either. And so that's the example of the loaded question, and that can lead to bias because people are a lot less inclined to agree with sort of the things that Hitler did, and uh, probably this is just associated, so we've lost How some of our... So we've actually biased our result. Okay, so leading question, loaded question, examples of what can happen in surveys to lead to measurement bias. Collection method, uh, so short rulers, um, scales that aren't right, um, things like that, consistently misrepresent the data in one direction. So those are all the examples of bias that we're going to study. Uh, and um, that's it for today. Uh, I'm hoping I can get everybody into the OneNote uh, right away so that we can, uh, so everybody can complete their work. So when it's in, when you have access to OneNote, if you get the app, when you finish your answers, you can actually just take a picture of them and put them into your, uh, put them into your OneNote for me to see. Okay, good. So that's bias.